Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I'm the social studies coordinator and acting, I'm sorry, social studies specialist and acting coordinator of secondary education for the Maine Department of Education. Today, we're going to be talking about contentious topics and how civil discourse should guide your curriculum to build community. A uh, link to the presentation will be made available at the end, so don't feel like you have to be taking notes or scribbling along the way. Uh, the title of our session, uh, I'm asking basically a republic if we can keep it on the old Ben Franklin idea of when he came out from the Constitution and they said, what type of government do we have? And he says, a republic, um, if we can keep it. I love this image. At some point, I may have to replace it. It's starting to get a little, a little dated. Uh, but I say this is 2020 in kind of a nutshell. COVID, presidential debates, elections, impeachments, Black Lives Matter. A lot of things in here are items, topics, issues that people may consider contentious. And yet this was really our world. Um, and a lot of it's still coming in today if we're still thinking about politics, if we're still thinking about Black Lives Matter, um, COVID, uh, we've got the Capitol in there, we had the events of January 6th, still fresh on a lot of people's minds. Uh, you know, these are the type of things that bubble into social studies. And I was talking with somebody once, you know, and they said, you know, there's so many contentious topics in social studies. And somebody else said, no, 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 social studies is contentious topics. That's what social studies is. And the, the, the problem with that, as I see it, is I've run into a lot of people, and this is a story I've told before, so it's a great interesting connection here, is in 2016, I was in Madison, Wisconsin, um, as the social studies curriculum leader for that district, and I had teachers saying, I don't think I can teach the election this year, it's too contentious. And in 2020, here in Maine, working with educators, having a lot of them say, I don't know if I can teach the election this year, it's, it's too contentious. And uh, I, I just remember asking if kids aren't going to get the election in social studies class, I don't know where else they're going to get it. I don't know where these things are going to, you know, bubble to the surface. And so I think we have to acknowledge that, yes, they are contentious. And yes, we must talk about them. Uh, our republic is supported by a democratic process, right? I mean, that's even one of the things people find contentious. Are we a democracy? Are we a republic? Are we a constitutional republic? Are we a constitutional uh, or a democratic republic? It's just the, the terminology that we use. And whatever you want to call it, I try to use that we are a democratic republic because we are a republic that is supported by those democratic process. And in order for it to work, we have to be willing to address these topics, all of them great appropriate, which we'll talk about, but I don't think there are things that we can really look at and say, well, I, you know, we, we should probably skip that. So our objectives for the next 90 minutes or so, and again, pre hitting record, I said, this is our first run. So we're gonna see how the timing goes on all this. Um, we are gonna get comfortable with discomfort. We are going to talk about why this can no longer be avoided why this is the responsibility of, of school. We're gonna drill down into looking at the, how perspective plays a role and language matters. It really, really does. There's so many things that you can set the stage on. Um, talk about how do we build a culture? And then if we're starting to think about the, the curricular big picture stuff in this, it's really about the type of questions that we're asking and then bringing that big picture approach to it. So I'm gonna start somewhat at a smaller level. Um, again, in this version, as I advertise this, at least here in Maine, this is not gonna be a lot of classroom pedagogy. Um, I have a different session where we talk about what this actually looks like in the classroom. Um, this is more of a one level up, bigger picture um, thought. And one of the things that I've been really trying to push on people when we talk about, you know, well, I don't, you know, are kids, are kids ready? Are they capable? Oh, it's, you know, so much stuff going on is I think as educators, a lot of us are probably familiar with Vygotsky and the idea of a zone of proximal development. So in the middle there, what I can learn on my own. Outside of that, two rings out, we have beyond my reach. But in the middle there, what I can learn with help. And I think we see this all the time in education, right? We pair students of different abilities. We give different level, reading level of resources. We bring in different activities to spark different types of learning. And we move students 
from what they can learn or for what they know to what they can learn as we move them through that. But we have to move into areas of things that they can't do and support them. And I think the idea of civil discourse around contentious topics is in that zone of proximal development. I've said this for years. If we're going to have these conversations, you don't just, you know, what the old basketball term, right? You don't just roll out the basketball and let them go. You don't just say, okay, kids, here we go. Ready? And contentious topic. You frame it out, you set the stage, and you support them. So I don't think the idea of civil discourse is beyond the reach of our students. I think it's something that they can learn with help. We're going to have this conversation um, today, uh, but we're gonna start by getting a little uncomfortable first. And Laura, I see your question. I'm gonna take a moment to read it more closely as everybody dives into this. Um, I figure if we're gonna talk about being uh, comfortable with being un being comfortable with being uncomfortable, I want everybody here to be just a little uncomfortable. So please take a moment, if you have not started reading this slide to do so at this time. The idea is that there is an incurable disease and we have come up with a medication that will save one of these five people's lives. You have to make the determination. And yes, I will tell you this right now. I would tell my students all the time, have an opinion, right? Just like have something, take a stand somewhere. That doesn't mean you can't change. It doesn't mean you can't be flexible. It doesn't mean it can't be somewhat a middle or moderate ground. But I'm going to ask all of you here today to take a stance and pick one of these five. And yes, is uncomfortable because that means you're not picking the other four. And so I'm going to give you just a moment. Please do not hit enter into the chat box at this time. But what I'm going to do is have you type in which number you want. Is it number one, number two, number three, number four, number five? And again, do not hit enter. I will count you down in just a little bit. We'll hit enter and we'll see everybody's responses all at the same time. That way you can't jump on the bandwagon. And then we're just going to see what did everybody think? So I bought you a little bit of time to go ahead and read that. I bought myself a little bit of time to read Laura's questions. So take a moment and decide which one of these five individuals would you designate as the person to get the medicine? And you cannot say lottery random. That's not taking a stance. That's just giving a solution without taking a stance. And you can't say, I don't know. I know it's rushed, but I'm gonna have you pick one. Got it, thank you, Laura. Okay. Yeah, let me think about that a little bit, Laura. Maybe what we will do is um, toward the end of the session, uh, I can bring people right in to have a chat into the webinar piece. And we can definitely have, uh, I traditionally do an after hours uh, where I'll stop recording and we can have a little bit more of an open conversation where we don't have any concerns about um, being recorded because sometimes some of these uncomfortable conversations need a little bit of privacy as well. So let's think about if there, uh, we can approach that at a different time. So thank you for letting me know that we can wait on that as well. Okay, I'm going to give you 10 more seconds. I'm going to push you along just for time. This was an, this would be an activity. We would do this a whole class period. We'd really get into this. But for here, you've got five more seconds. Three, two, and hit enter in your chat bar. Like everybody to take a quick look. And my question to the group, any of you can answer at this time, do we have an answer? Would you say the group has reached an answer? Yes or no? Feel free to just use yes or no and type it into the chat box. First response is no. Uh, so we've got a couple of yeses. Gretchen says majority would say four. We've got some yeses and some not yets. So what did we decide? Laura says there's not one right answer. What did we decide? Each of you 
picked one, at least those who had entered, I did not check to see if everybody submitted one. I'm gonna go off Gretchen here. Gretchen said a majority would say four. And there are some people who said, well, yeah, we have an answer. And I think we've built into that the idea of, well, there's, there's a majority. And I will say that I think this is actually a majority as I watched it go through. Um, a lot of times when I do this, I think we get a plurality, um, but not always a majority. And so is that kind of the end then? Well, we got a majority. There's our answer. And uh, for those watching the video, uh, not seeing the crowd, the majority, according to Gretchen, and I would agree with, says male age 42. Can you read his bio there again? I will say that in the times I've done this, the most common winner, quote unquote, most vote getter is usually five, but not always. Um, four does come up. One is very rare, right? Is that the athlete? Yep, one very rarely comes in. Could you see students, if I were to just say, okay, class, we voted. Four is the winner, moving along. Could you see students having troubles accepting either that final answer or a final answer in general if it wasn't unanimous? And I'm thinking that we can all think of at least one student or class that we've had where we'd say, oh, there'd be some struggles. So what would we do to support this type of discussion? And I see that, yes, but why? Okay, so we could, we could start to have people talk about, well, why I chose this person. Or we could say, well, this is the winner because, because I didn't set any of that up. I didn't say we're going to reach our decision, majority wins. I didn't give anybody any opportunity to lay out an argument. I just put something on the table and had you all take a stance. I did it intentionally, somewhat for time, intentionally just to get us active uh, because I don't like just talking at you for the entire time and having you sit passively by. But part of this is the idea that when we address these type of topics, we have to be thoughtful in what we're asking of kids, what our goal is, and the supports that we have in place. And so that's part of what we're gonna to try to accomplish today as I lay out some of these things. Uh, Eric Lau, uh, formerly of uh, the Obama administration, I believe, uh, I think that's correct. Um, he now works at the Aspen Institute and he is the founder of uh, Citizen University. Uh, if you've ever heard of Civic Saturdays, uh, they come into an area in a public event, pre-COVID definitely. Um, now they do them virtually. And they basically would have, he says it's like a church-like event, right? Everybody gets up and preaches their beliefs, but it's in an environment where all are welcome and all are celebrated for this piece. And he has this great line where, he said, the reason about it is democracy is faith-fueled. It only works when enough of us believe it works. He says that what, what makes it work in the United States is not the structures laid out in the Constitution. It's not the checks and balances and this and that. It works because we believe it works. And I think that's one of the things we've seen in the past four or five, six, seven, eight years, as people, I think, in general would agree, the idea of more and more contentious in uh, our society, especially politics. The structures haven't necessarily changed. The Constitution has not been amended. And I know there'd be plenty of people who could say, yeah, but the, you know, this group's doing this or this group's now doing that. And that's not how it's supposed to be. But it really then comes back to, do we think it works? And we're starting to talk about the election stuff from 2020 and voter fraud or not voter fraud or this, that. If people don't think their vote matters, what happens to our elections? If people don't think the system works, what happens? And so I think that idea is that we have to give people the belief that it does, that that is what they need from us. And you see, this is from 2017, January of 2017. 
So it's over four years old now. This is the latest I could find because it goes beyond just election days. It goes beyond just bills and uh, legislation. Roughly four in 10 have personally experienced online harassment. And we have people who are, you know, the, set, the one on the right, the second one's the one that stands out to me. 27% of people have chosen to not post something online. So we are now starting to say, I don't even feel comfortable talking, speaking, expressing my opinion online. Which a lot of times, if we're thinking about social media, often Facebook, these are our friends, right? You friend, quote unquote, friend somebody on Facebook. And these are the people who are harassing us. These are the people we're, we're afraid to post something online because the, the faith in our democracy and the faith in how we interact with one another is spilling over into all parts of our lives. Fear of being harassed. How am I gonna be judged for my physical appearance, my race, gender, my views? What have I done, right? Th this permeates everything around us. And I, I, I ask how many people, and feel free if you would like to post in the chat, how many people here have had to unfriend or block or change a privacy setting? Because I know Facebook now has the what, unfollow, even though you're still friends, but you don't see their stuff in their feed. I think that's how it works. How many people have had someone you would consider a friend or family member that you have had to change how you interact with them online. Again, blocking, unfollowing something because of this type of experience. And again, feel free to, to put in the chat if you have, but you, you, know, you don't have to because that's hard. That's hard, again, our, our friends. And so, so what does this mean? Snooze is good. Thank you, Melanie. Purposefully keeping distance, yes. All right, so, so I get to that, right? The government teacher in me, the civics person in me says, you know, our democracy depends on us all voting. And part of me is like, oh, our own sanity and like our ability to function as a community. And that's why I include the community part in the title of this session, because I think it goes so beyond that. And all of these things that are going on, I argue it's not because we spent too much time talking about contentious issues when we were younger. Uh, we, we didn't spend enough. We've continued to isolate students more and more because rightfully so, this is not a judgment, rightfully so as an educator has become harder and harder to withstand the criticisms and concerns of outsiders when they're looking into our classroom. So it's like, oh, well, I, you know, I should shy away from this. I should shy away from that. I don't want to get. And what we're doing is the further we step away from that, the more we're setting up you know, these issues. In, in my opinion, I think the more we can get into them, I think it takes practice to be disagreeable. There's a great book from the late 90s. It was an essay and then a book written by Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone. Uh, called this because he bases it on the idea of a decline in league bowling participation. You see the chart there on the right-hand side. It's uh, up to the late 90s. By this point, it looks like there'd be no bowling leagues left if we continue that trend. I don't think that that's 100% true. But that's his little the, his snapshot and says that, you know, there are other things. What are we participating in terms of community? Bowling leagues, church groups, Knights of Columbus, League of Women Voters, 4-H. All of these groups were community centered where you came to interact with others. Now our world's become a little more like this the less we participate in those things. And I ask, you know, it's not a challenge, it's kind of that inquisitive piece to, to, for you to think about pre-COVID, because this is a really hard question to ask in COVID, but the idea of 
do you have a weekly or monthly or very or like a regularly scheduled group of people that you hang out with who are not really necessarily self-selected? You joined, you know, bowling league might be friends, but you're sitting at the lanes with another team. Your church group, because of your religious affiliation, you, you come to this community church, not for any other reason, but for that. So there might be some shared beliefs, but anybody who's in your PTA is wanting to help the school, but they're bringing their own beliefs to it. How often are you engaging in these type of things? Because now, especially with COVID, it's very bubble, right? And we decide now on social media who we talk to, what our bubbles are, where we're going to get our information. We can read the news that we want. We can watch the news that we want. And as we've done this, if we go back to Robert Putnam talking about shared spaces, schools are one of the few that are left. Our communities rally around schools. Our kids, they have their grade levels, right? And that's what brings them in. They have their classes. I chose US history, so I'm in third hour with Mr. Schmidt. They didn't pick who was in there with them. That brings our, our, our communities together around sports and music and art shows and any program that you can think about with our schools. And so schools are that nexus that make it hard and necessary. And I don't know if this will help, but I doing a lot of research on this. I look in that this is not new. The concerns we're having now is not new. In 1848, Horace Mann, and I've, I'm not going to read you the whole thing because that's bad presentation skills, but you'll notice some of the bolded parts of this long excerpt. Worrying about kids growing up in ignorance worry that the only knowledge they may pick up is from angry political discussions. So in 1848, Horace Mann is worried about students getting caught up in the rhetoric of angry politics. And this was before Facebook and social media. Even the great John Dewey agrees, 1934, the purpose of education is to give the young, the things they need to be an orderly member of our society. To interact, to be in these communities. ASCD 1957, the purpose of schools, last part, product, uh, pro productively in a democratic society. Education week, the day after September 11th. The last line, the last part, students must, they must practice age appropriate versions of the roles that they will face later in life and deal with related problems and complications. Schools are to be this microcosm of the world. And so it feels so rough right now, it is. But it's, it's not new. This is not a challenge that, that we're taking up for the first time. And I think part of the thing we need to do is keep that perspective about what we want to do and what we can do. And perspective matters because it can really change things. Um, has anybody, does anybody know what this is a picture of? Any history people in the room familiar with this? item, this artifact, we'll call it an artifact. Anybody familiar with this artifact? And I'm giving my little bit of wait time to see if anything shows up in the chat. The Sun King. Karina says, the back of the chair at the Constitutional Convention. This is the chair that George Washington used, known as the Rising Sun Armchair. No judgment, Rebecca. Good guess. We appreciate all our guesses. And uh, James Madison, again, because we, we have no records except for Madison's own personal notes, reported Ben Franklin saying, I've often looked at that behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting, but now I know that it is a rising sun. Right? It's a perspective. We have no idea. But based on what they've done, it's like, ah, this is, this is rising. And so with that in mind, 
And I hope all of the audio comes through clean on this. So please let me know. But I'm going to go ahead and hit play on this because Valerie is going to give us perspective to think about. What if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? What if our future is not dead, but still waiting to be born? What if this is our great transition? So what if this so perspective? She's talking about the, the darkness, right? And I, I like this piece because I feel like so many people, especially social studies people who are deep into civics and government and you know some of the equity issues of our history or, or our country, both contemporary and historical, like, man, you know, but the darkness of the tomb signals an end. The darkness of the womb signals a rebirth. And we heard Amanda Gorman in the 2021 inauguration, her poem, Somehow we weathered and witnessed the nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. Perspective. If it's broken, that's an issue. If it's unfinished, it's potential. And so thinking about the perspective on this. So I've, I've hoped to this point, you're like, okay, Joe, got it. I, I, I've gotten a little uncomfortable I'm not super comfortable with it being in schools, but I understand why it has to be in schools. Okay, I'm on board here. Perspective matters. Perspective matters. What should I do? One of the first things that I want people to be aware of, especially because it fits right in as a nice transition to uh, perspective, is that words matter. And how we frame out all of this can make such a huge difference. And so one of the ways, one of the pieces is the idea of contentious versus controversial. Unless I've made a mistake, and I usually catch myself, I don't think I've used controversial at all. I've used contentious. And this really hit on me last summer when talking about controversial issues. And we're going to hear a little bit about Diana Hess um, in her book, Controversy in the Classroom, later. And I thought to myself, you know, there was, you know, articles about, you know, the controversy with Black Lives Matter. I'm like, what, are, what is, there's, a, there, I feel like there's an implied understanding of the word controversial. And is it controversial, Black Lives Matter? What, or what are we saying? And so I came to the, like, it's contentious. I'm not going to argue that. I'm not saying everybody's on board. I'm not even saying everybody should be on board. I'm saying that I think when we frame something as controversial, if you dig deep into what that means versus something that's contentious, and the example I give is, would you want the local news reporting on your classroom about the controversial something in your classroom or the contentious? Because I think right away, like, oh, I don't want to be, mm -mm. the controversy at school district X, Right? There, there's a piece to that. And so I think when we set the stage, whether we're talking about gun control and gun violence, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ, religious beliefs, I think you have to say these are contentious. Otherwise, if we tell people, well, let's talk about the controversy with same-sex marriage, and you've got an LGBTQ student in your room, what's the hidden message? Maybe not a hidden message. What's the subtle societal message? If we say we're going to talk about the controversy of owning a gun, and you've got students who are big gun owners, what's the piece? And so these things do add up, and they do set your goals. And I think a big one is discussion and debate. Those terms are not interchangeable. And I really have become a strong believer in this. They're not interchangeable. Discussion is to be heard. 
And I'm going to get deeper into this. I think it's the next slide or two. I've really done this out. A debate is a competition to deliver the knockout punch. And so if you tell kids in your mind, okay, we're going to have a discussion. I want a nice, free-flowing, open classroom. And you say, okay, kids, today we're going to debate whatever. Have you shifted kids enough unconsciously that you've sabotaged your own goals? How are they approaching it? If you go tell somebody, um, yes, I would like to have a debate with you about X, Y, Z. What is, what's their internal process and feelings about that? And again, I will say, Joe, this is a little, wow. Okay, we're 40 minutes in and we're debating discussion versus debate. Yep, actually, we're going to debate five Ds. Discourse, diatribe, dialogue, discussion, and debate. Because I think these are so many little things that add up along the way where we can unintentionally set our kids up for failure. And so I look at what I call the five Ds along two spectrums, one way to two way communication and collaborative versus competitive. So if we start on the left discourse, it's a one way conversation that's collaborative. I tell you what I think and you tell me what you think. And what makes a discourse is they're not really connected. How was your day? My day was X, Y, Z. Oh, well, don't forget to take the trash out, right? That, that's discourse. We're sharing information back and forth. The, the part in here for the students, it's not a reaction. It's not competing. It's not related to what the others have said. This is a lot of times what conversations are if we're not really truly listening. We're just having one way communication with somebody who's listening, but not really reacting. The bottom left, there's a competitive version of this known as a diatribe, where the purpose is to forcibly, potentially abusive, uh, make you hear me. And I do not recommend this for classroom use. I, I don't know of a reason why we should competitively share one-way information. But on the right-hand side, I think this is what we oftentimes do in our classes. And the lines are so blurry in our own minds and in our students' minds that we get it messed up. So this is all two-way. Dialogue is a collaborative effort. It's a sharing of information to build an understanding. We are all on the same page. We are open to all information. And that's it. The role of the teacher is to make sure all the voices are heard. Yes, but I'm responding to you. That's a great point, Gretchen. Um, that reminds me of this. Has anybody else heard about this? Have you seen this? What do you guys think about this? Discussion is one step removed from dialogue because there is a competitive part to it. You start off with an open dialogue of bringing information to the table to then decide what to do with it. What is the best answer? We're gonna have a discussion about what to do on our field trip. We're gonna have a discussion about what's for supper tonight. What do you want? Pizza, chicken, takeout, burgers? Okay, got four options. What does everybody think? Right, because in the end, you do have to decide what to have for dinner. But it's not a debate. It's open. Everybody gets to come to the table. Now, a debate, then, we're, we're intentionally kind of drawing some lines here. The sharing of information is competitive. I'm not going to give you helpful information. I'm going to just tell you why my information is better, why your side is wrong, why my side is superior. There's traditionally two sides, maybe three. And then we pick a winner. But notice we do pick a winner in a discussion after we've heard all things. It's a semi-collaborative effort. In debate, you know, it's pizza versus chicken. Versus, I would say in a discussion, it's pizza or chicken 
or burgers or fish? What do you guys think? These are all of our options. Anybody else, right? We've opened up those, those pieces. And again, now we're five minutes into Joe, really? Now we're 40, you're still talking about this? Yes, because these things build. I don't think you would just jump right into a debate if students haven't had practice with discourse or with dialogue. Those structures are in places, in place. And I think a lot of times we naturally get some of this and then assume that we naturally have it all in place. And again, I, I've used myself, and this one I do trip myself up from time to time still, interchanging discussion and debate. Or is it really just a dialogue? So where do these fit in your classrooms? How do you structure this? So this is my first attempt. I've been working on this one for a while now, um, a while being a month or so. This kind of one page cheat sheet for teachers. What is the purpose of dialogue? What are students gonna be doing? And what's the structure, the role of the educator? So how would you move students through this? Where do you engage in this? What are the topics that you would want to have just an open dialogue about versus the ones you'd wanna have a discussion versus the ones you'd actually want to debate? because those words matter, right? So I've kind of looked, okay, Joe, who cares? Really? You're still going on about these very whatever, discussion, debate, who cares? I love this quote from Brooke Gladstone. The book is called The Trouble with Reality. It says, part of the problem stems from the fact that facts, even a lot of facts, do not constitute reality. Reality is what forms after we filter, arrange, and prioritize those facts and marinate them in our values and traditions. Reality is personal. And the example I use is July 4th, 1776. That's a fact, right? I, you know, I, the facts associated. We know what that date is. It happened. Here's the documentation. Here's who was there. Here's who signed it. But what's the reality of that date? Is it the greatest date in US history? Were the right people there? Right, you started to get those things that we really, that's what any socialized educator thinks, especially we really will enjoy getting into that. So we take these facts and have kids play with them to figure out like their own perspective on this and what's the, the stance you're gonna take. But we have to understand that their reality is personal. And my favorite line that I love from this all the time is that we marinate them in our values and traditions. Where are those kids coming from? What are they hearing at home? What's their background? Race, gender, religion, socioeconomic status. That all plays a role. And so we need to find that intersection of being able to have the dialogue, discussion, debates, bringing our students around these topics. Because our job is to teach people, young people, how to talk. And this is probably better. There's probably more love for this slide in Dane County than I would ever get in, in Maine for this one. I'm guessing a lot of people have had the, the pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Well, now it's Dean Hess um, at the University of Wisconsin, who's done a lot of work with this. Right? That's our job. To part of our job so that kids can have these experiences, but we need to set them up for it. Right. And so she talks about um, well, I'll have to change that slide, I got a little cut off. I, I just love the first part. This is page six of, her, six of her book, Controversy in the Classroom. Schools have not just the right, but the obligation to do this. We need to make sure right at the end, multiple and competing views are aired, fairly considered and critically evaluated. That's our job. And again, kind of speaking a little bit to Laura's question and different bills and legislation around the country, not our job to tell them what to think or how to think, but to think, to engage. Because this, I love this data set. And I talked with um, Dr. Kawashima Ginsburg um, a couple of years ago, and then I just double checked with her about a month ago again. Um, this, this will probably not be updated. I think this is so great because NAEP data it's hard to come upon. Um, but she took all of the 2010 NAEP data, broke it down 
by who the students were, race, gender, socioeconomic status, et cetera, and found a common denominator in high school students, those who debated more than once a month scored higher on the NAEP, regardless of any other pieces. In middle school, it's mixed. There was some higher, some lower, whatever. In elementary, it was almost backwards. And uh, she does report out, it's a pretty, it was a smaller sample size and some of the self-reported stuff, there might be some stuff, um, you know, complicating that data and probably should be re-examined, not that it was, but pulling these pieces in. But if you look at this high school piece, students who say, yeah, we debate in class, score higher on tests. So I always tell my teachers, this is what you can take to your administrators. So for all the administrators here, these type of interactions with students lead to higher test scores and higher graduation rates. And I hate to always boil it down to something like that, but sometimes we just have to boil it down to something like that. But now the educators are always like, yeah, but, but um, Joe, right? Like I get it, you can get in trouble. And I'm hearing this um, both when it happens or potentially did happen in a classroom, but also in legislation around the country where people are like, teachers cannot you know, indoctrinate students. And then I love listening to the testimony. I love listening to the administrators, the pre-service educate, like the, the higher ed uh, people in education who teach our pre-service teachers. Uh, and they'll say, yeah, we know this. Like we cover this with kids. Like teachers aren't coming into the classroom and saying, okay, here's what you're all gonna believe. But we are human and it is a fear that it's like, okay, well, what if I say, well, how is that gonna be interpreted? How is this, right? So I, do, I don't want you to think, Joe, you're being completely ignorant of the, the potential here. Cause I know that this is, right? I understand you must deliver the curriculum. So then for the administrators, the curriculum coordinators, and those who are creating the curriculum, are you creating a curriculum that teachers can deliver that allows for this type of piece? After the events of January 6th, insurrection at the Capitol, I met with multiple districts who had you know, teachers who talked about it and there was concern in the community. And you know that was one of the things I, I talked about. I said, okay, so what class was it talked about in? Oh, it was a you know, middle school current events class. And I said, okay, did it align with what your district would expect in terms of classroom pedagogy and delivery? Yes. Was it assessed in a way that's a, yes. Did it align with the curriculum of that class? Yes. Okay. Can you go to bat for the teacher and saying, it follows our school board approved curriculum which I always think is helpful for thinking about our school boards all over the political spectrum. Curriculum school board approved, at least that's always my understanding, I believe. And we're following that curriculum, right? The curriculum isn't what to do minute by minute or day by day. As I could understand if a teacher was in the middle of like calculus class and said, okay, quick, hold on here. We need to talk about what happened. Or if they're talking about um, ancient Greece, and it gets sidetracked, you know, although somebody made the argument, well, why couldn't you talk about Athens in light of some of this stuff? I said, oh, yeah, I'm sure you can make connections. But if you're in a current events class and it's lined up in those pieces and it's best practices, pedagogy, stuff like that, that, then that's not an issue and it shouldn't be an issue. And I would hope our administrators would support our educators. But so the piece in here is to give educators the space to have this is we understand you can't give your own beliefs. You can't supervent the curriculum, which means we just need to make sure that the curriculum has the space for it. Because I don't think anybody here, I'm assuming, uh, anybody here is like, well, you know, what we really need is a curriculum that's 180 days of memorizing names and dates and places and facts. And then our final exam is, you know, 500 multiple choice questions that are, you know, names, dates, facts. I think we're, we're striving for more than that. And we just need to make sure that the curriculum aligns with that. So then now what? So what do we do with that then? I think we have to take this as an opportunity to 
to know that these type of curricular settings around contentious topics will be contentious and not be afraid of it, but rather see it as an opportunity to see our kids. When a student is reacting strongly to a contentious topic, what's going on with them, right? Think about that marinated in our values and traditions. We're, we're, we're pretty quick, you know, to judge and isolate and think about people. But Barrett Twinday Thurston says, like, you know, so well, let's think about what's the pain in that person's life that's causing that. And if we're giving our students these opportunities to have these type of discussions, this is potentially an avenue to understand our students better, to see the wound, right? Because we want the whole child, the social emotional learning components as well. And if we protect them in these bubbles where everybody is protected and safe, right? We wanna be safe in this pedagogical piece. We shouldn't see this lashing out as a negative, but it gives us an opportunity to see our kids. Back to Valerie, she's got this line of, but we need to then make sure we're not setting up our kids to be, a, uh, to be enemies, but opponents. I think we're back to some of that nuanced language. Are we debating these highly sensitive topics? If we're talking about a student's identity, boy, that's going to be a struggle to debate, right? There's a winner. <laughs> Your identity is right and yours isn't. That's, 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 uh, that, that's an issue, right, for a student. And so I think that's where we have enemies, trying to define those pieces. And I, I'll get into this a little bit deeper. But again, think about those Ds. Can we have dialogue around very important things where it's just a safe space to talk, where it's not an enemy, it's not a debate, we're not looking for a winner. Those of you who've been in Madison long enough, I was in Madison when, um, oh, now I'm going to blank on the name, I thought about it earlier, the, there was the young African-American um, boy shot by police in 2013, 14, I'm gonna say Robinson, but I don't know if that's, I can't remember, I'm sorry for not remembering. And I, we were having to write up protocols for classroom talk. And it's not always students talking up. You know, I always say, cause I'm a very auditory um, person. I, I, I don't take notes. I struggle with notes. But I did have to acknowledge that sometimes the student's strong as voice. Hey, it was Robinson. Thank you, Gretchen. Tony Robinson. Um, that sometimes the student's strongest voice is written. And so are we setting that up for them to still have that same ability to share? Jessica, good question. We're going to get to classroom community in just a second. Thank you. And so we do need to set this up. So I'll build off Jessica asking classroom community because society becomes how you behave. A good example is the best sermon, right? So if we want kids to be able to do this, we need to show some of this. We need to set the stage. We need to uh, remind them civility is not a sign of weakness. We can disagree. We can be disagreeable. But we have to make sure that that's clear from the beginning. Because if we're not going to do this, if we're not going to prepare our students to go deal with the struggles that our society is struggling with, who is? And if now isn't a time to do it, then when is the time? So, Jessica, you beat me by about, what was that, 45 seconds. So let's start at the beginning because it's a very good place to start. And I will not try to sing the sound of music to you because none of you have done anything to deserve um, that fate. It does start with a classroom culture and community. This is from Facing History and Ourselves. And again, we have the presentation. You'll have the link in there for fostering civil discourse. 
I think the idea of a classroom contract and classroom rules is a common one. Right? I don't think I'm telling anybody anything new. I think where we miss the boat, and I'm speaking from some from my own personal experience as well, and from seeing other classrooms, is what do we do with our community contract? Who writes it? What do we do with it on day two? Three, four, 44, 94, 174. We go over the classroom rule day one, right? Especially at the older grade, excuse me, older grade levels. Everybody knows the rules. Okay, sign here, whatever, turn it in. Okay, here we go. And then we get into the conversations. But what are we then setting up to kids if we ignore that component of it? So step one here from the Morning Science Center for Teaching Social Responsibility, create a safe, respectful, and supportive tone in your classroom. I think that is the contract, the classroom culture, the rules, whatever you want to call it, and it's day one. And then it's on the board, on, the, on your whiteboard, uh, cork board, whatever it is. It's copied, taped to desks. Inside, you give them a journal. Inside cover of their journal. Monday mornings, let's go over our classroom contract, our classroom agreements. Before a contentious conversation, a reminder. It's not a one-time thing. And again, I'm speaking from my experience on this, what I would do, right? Here's our rules. We've got the, okay, yep, check, we're good. How do we set the stage so that kids get this every single day? Because I'll tell you, again, this next section, we'll talk about how we get there um, with some of it. You know, but I think it's so important that students, not only do we have that classroom contract, but the students write it. So when I would set up my classroom contract and agreement, we would have some very basic rules and the students would write most of it. But like I would want and say, okay, we're going to challenge the idea, not the person. That's, that's non-negotiable. If you guys don't think of it, it doesn't mean it gets left behind or you can vote it out. Nope. We're going to challenge the idea, not the person. And some of this stems from, so when I was doing uh, my master's work, I did research with Barbara Coloroso, and some of her stuff was on the difference between teasing and bullying. And I printed it up and I put it on the board. What is teasing versus bullying? And I had juniors and seniors, right? So it was a different level in there about, you know, what they could read and expect. But students would point it out about a power imbalance. Oh, come on, Mr. Schmidt, I was just teasing. Okay, let's go to the board. Has anybody ever seen, I'm going to pull names from my chat. Has anybody ever seen Karina tease Allison? Or is Allison always teasing Karina? Oh, it's one way. Okay, so that's a power imbalance. It's not teasing then. Oh, it was not my fault they took it that way. No, it is. And so we had all of this laid out and we referenced it. And students would use it. It became part of our classroom culture to have these conversations but understand, challenge the idea, not the person. I had seniors apologizing to each other and having to accept apologies when we would attack a person. That's a stupid idea. Okay. You're stupid for, think for thinking that. Apology. Class knew it. Class would say it. Right? Because you bring those pieces in. They have to live it. So you have to let them write it. And then you have to bring it up all the time. Here's some other examples of some you know, potential things to put in there. But I don't think I want to spend a lot of time in those details of it. But just coming back to the idea of once you have it, what do you do with it? And I, I, cannot, I cannot understate the importance of putting something up for kids to see it all the time. Um, Oh, and I can't think of the word. In elementary school, we have all of our uh, anchor charts, right, as examples. And I think a lot of times in high school, we lose that. And then in elementary school, do we have those anchor charts that we referred to for this type of stuff? I think yes. And I think, and it should come up to middle school and high school. Because I can talk about my students, you know, looking at the bullying versus teasing. I can also tell you one of the things I never thought would happen is I had put up um, a DOK wheel and a Bloom's taxonomy for me in my classroom as a reminder. 
and a student called out another student on um on DOK once and I said I was like what and they're like Mr. Schmidt you're always over there standing by looking at it they picked up on it so that I actually made it an intentional part of my class at the beginning of the year talking about blooms talking about DOK how are we going to push things and then point it at it and reference it students will pick up on those things but we have to make sure it's a constant visual reminder and we bring it back so again the idea can you tape it on their desk can you refer every Monday we're going to read our classroom contract or before the conversation happens right we don't want it to get bad and then say um okay don't forget um John hey remember there's the rules you know let's start with that type of stuff because then it's all easy I just always have to find a place to put this in because I think this might be my my favorite little meme you know you just set up the classroom contract and sip your tea and you go home Right, because it's just that easy. But we know it's not. So then how do we build on this? Okay, so day one, Joe, we've got the customer concept. We're gonna do it, we're gonna build on it, we're gonna reference it all the time. The kids have to practice it. And again, for me, this is a curricular piece in there. It's easy to say. Okay, in this class, uh, we really need to have a, a good discussion or debate or however we want to frame it around, around uh, gun rights, freedom of speech. I'm thinking of my government class. Um, uh, shoot, I just lost one. Uh, climate change and abortion. Those fit, right? That, that's part of our big curriculum. Great. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Leading up to that, and I will say in September of last year, I wrote a couple of blogs where I said, if you're teaching the election, November, you need to be teaching it now. You start now. I called it planning for tomorrow today. So where in your curriculum are you setting up places and examples for the slow pitch before you get to the tough stuff? And it can be content driven. It can also just be fun. Because discussion Debates, these are skill based. Have a debate is a hot dog a sandwich. Does it align to your content? No. Does it align to a necessary skill required to debate your future content? Yes. Chocolate versus vanilla ice cream. Let's have a discussion. Practice the rules of discussion with your students. Content? No. Skills for the big one? Yes. So on the right, I have like kindergartners can do this. What makes a better pet, puppies or kittens? Evidence-based claims, evidence reasoning. The one that's blowing my mind right now is, um, is soup, no, is cereal with milk in it, soup. And every part of me wants to say no, but I've done um, thinker analytics. I've done an argument map with this as an example, and I don't have a good argument. I feel like I, I have to finally admit that cereal with milk and it is a soup, but I still don't like it. But I practice something along the way, right? And those can, they can be content pieces, but they can also just be fun, engaging type where kids are gonna have a little stake in the game but we're not discussing or debating their identity, not to be something deeply personal in their lives. John, you've had the, yeah, the cereal. There's a great game and I actually have it out somewhere. I think I put it away. Oh, here. I Descent, which has 83 different cards. Like um, the argument is it's okay to wear socks with sandals. And then what, what's better, middle school or high school years? Would you rather um, have bad breath or bad body odor, stuff like that, right? And it, but you take any of those questions, can they follow the structures in place that will be essential to the tough topics later? And again, they can be fun ones or find in your curriculum where are a little bit more of the lower stake pieces to have out. I talk with elementary teachers all the time about have a discussion. Don't say, what's the capital of Maine? Augusta. What's the capital of Wisconsin? Madison. Ask them where should the capital be today and why? Portland? Augusta? 
Bangor, let's discuss. Madison, Milwaukee, Green Bay, Eau Claire, or not Eau Claire, Wausau, a little more center in the state, Stevens Point maybe. Why? Central location, population centers. You know, it used to be rivers were a big thing. I think highways have replaced river transportation. So you can build content things in, but it's still low stakes pieces to get to the big one. But you have to start ahead of time. And the big thing that I'm really trying to push on people, this was kind of my big learning in the past year, is pulling from Dr. Dean Hess, Dr. Diana Hess, Dean Diana Hess, uh, Dr. Paula McAvoy, who's now at um, uh, NC State, and some others who've done work on this, is the way to keep yourself out of trouble is don't debate empirical data topics. Is climate change real? Is racism real? That sets the stage for students to say things to get in trouble. And it sets the stage for teachers to say things to get in trouble or get frustrated and upset because a, a student said something and then react back to it. So what I recommend is if you're going to talk about something like racism, you can start with the empirical data. Here's the data we have for BIPOC versus white uh, average educational attainment, average income, uh, average you know, experience with our criminal justice system. We're, we're not debating this. We are going to look at the data. I've had people say, well, some people don't believe the data or they'll argue with the facts. That's fine. They don't have to believe. They can do whatever they want with the data. We are presenting information. We're not debating it. And then the next day, should the government be involved in trying to end racism? Should the government be involved in trying to stop, right? Because we can say average temperatures around the world um, in the past years or melting polar cap. We can even bring in, you know, the centuries of data of different temperature pieces and present all of it. But then the, what you want to debate or discuss, again, being careful with what are you actually trying to achieve? Is it a, uh, is it a dialogue, discussion, or debate? is that policy question. I can believe racism is 100% real and that the government should do nothing about it. I can believe racism is 100% real and that the government should be doing significantly more about it. Our political parties are really about policy. And so if you can shift that piece Right? Let's not ask, well, is racism real? Because then when kids say, no, okay, what do we say with, you know, with those kids, right? Like, that's where you start to get in trouble. Or teacher responds to, here's the data. Based on what we saw yesterday and your own personal beliefs, political leanings, ideology, religious beliefs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, what should be done? And I'm blanking, is it, I, was it the interview from Dr. Hessen? Somewhere I heard like, right, what that does is it brings everybody to the table because everybody has an opinion about what should be done. So we're not gonna debate the data part of it. We're not gonna debate, is racism a thing? We're not gonna debate, is gender inequality a thing? We're not gonna debate, sh uh, should there be same-sex marriage? constitutional. Not everybody agrees with it, though. We're going to debate the policies of it. Should somebody be able to have their religious beliefs? Should it be okay? Should businesses have policies for exemptions around religious beliefs? Not does this person get medicine or marriage certificate, 
but can I excuse myself? And then my business where I work has to step in. Though that's your spectrum of bringing people in. That's what you work with your teachers in. What are these topics? What are the ones you're most worried about? How do you practice to get them along the way? And what's the policy question to get involved? So what's the bottom line on all of this? Is that they have to practice it. Right? This is, for me, this is a claims evidence reasoning component. And yes, people can pull evidence from a lot of different places. Got that, I understand. People can disagree with a lot of stuff, but let them practice that piece. My claim is that the government should not be involved. Here's my evidence, here's my reasoning. And you will, again, you'll get this presentation. Um, I'll give you a link at the end. I have a page around con courageous conversations about contentious topics. There's a series of webinars to go deeper in there. There's work from Dr. Hess in there. Uh, Illinois Civics Group has resources. There's online curriculum guides, places to find, you know, pro-con information. I'm trying to think what's in there. Um, Better Arguments Project, which I know that um, uh, Melanie is doing some work with. So there's just tons of resources to take you to places to help with the supports of this. Um, learning for Justice, the old teaching tolerance. They've got a middle school lesson, facing history in ourselves. They've got a guide for this. That's all referenced on that site as well. But it's the idea that we do have to practice it. Like anything else, except for disciplinary reading and social studies, it's not just practice makes perfect. And, my main friends have heard me talk about that forever. Just more reading doesn't increase, increase reading. But in this case, practicing your skills in uh, dialogue, discussion, and debate will help your students get better. So here's the approach I've taken. This is facing history and ourselves. This is their pedagogical triangle. And you will see this laid out on my contentious or on my uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion webpage. And I think this is the approach when I work with administrators. You need to, if you want informed, civically responsible kids, you need to provide intellectual rigor, ethical reflection, and emotional engagement. The intellectual rigor is the content. Making sure there's quality African-American studies, LGBTQ studies, gender studies, those components in there. And I know that social studies has been really good for making sure that famous people in women's history are on page 28 and famous African-Americans are on page you know, 41, little slide thing, um, but really getting in depth. There's the rigor part of it. The ethical reflection component, to me, that's your curriculum review. Because what I get a lot of times from people, well, can we, um, like what unit can we do or if we do a civil rights unit, like, is that better? Um, you really have to rethink everything. So I said, ethical effect, have you really thought about your social studies curriculum? You know, and the example I use is you can go double the length of time you do your civil rights movement unit or introduce a new unit or make sure, well, we used to get to World War II, but now we'll make sure we get through the civil rights movement. But if you still teach reconstruction, in kind of the traditional way, you're probably setting up for a lot of mixed messaging with the kids. How are you approaching, you know, the idea of slavery in the Civil War? How are you approaching Reconstruction and the Jim Crow era? How are you approaching W.E.B. Du Bois and their work um, in founding the NAACP and that movement that led up into that? And I'm not saying everything then has to be completely restructured. It has to become an African-American history U.S. course. Are you looking at the places to make sure where you're not reinforcing stereotypes on one end and avoiding some conversations on one end and then trying to play catch up over here? And the last part is the emotional engagement for me. That's um, looking at student, uh, what do I say, self, student, and staff, kind of your internal piece. Are you giving students an opportunity for them to engage kind of in their own thinking? 
Are you supporting staff members in learning more about anti-bias work or decolonization in the curriculum? Are you offering opportunities, you know, whether it's supporting an outside piece or bringing stuff in to say, hey, because on the webpage, you'll see there's a self part. There's, there's videos and webinars and stuff for educators. I would just watch it on my own to change some of my thinking. Then there's stuff for students. And then there's stuff as an administrator, you can say, okay, we're gonna read this book together. We're gonna do this video series together and discuss. And so I think you need to do all of that. And I like the triangle because you can start on any one of them and work your way through. But you do have to work your way through. You can't just say, well, we've got a new two week unit on the civil rights movement, we're done. Because if the rest of the curriculum counteracts that, and you have teachers potentially teaching it in a harmful way, then you're still having issues in it. And so thinking about how do you have these type of conversations to expose kids thoughtfully in your curriculum so that teachers are delivering the curriculum, which they're allowed to do, in that rigorous way for students to explore, for students to think. And they'll talk about contentious topics all day long. I think as educators, we know that, but we're afraid to get into that. And this is what I've kind of broken down here a little bit. So when you do that triangle, right, it's the content. Uh, if you go to my diversity, equity, and inclusion website, this, these are like the headings. So there's resources for African-American studies, ethnic studies, gender studies, LGBTQ under content. There's resources for curriculum review. There's re for resources for finding diverse books. There's the self, students, and staff reflection stuff. There's the resources back to the courageous conversations. And it's work. There is not a simple fix to this. I do not have a 90-minute pitch where you send the teachers and now we're good. I don't have a unit or an activity to do. And I'm, I think probably the people here understand and know that I'm preaching to the choir a little bit. But just that reminder of all of these things that come back in. And the more I've done the work on this, the more I keep kind of pivoting back to, it's the conversations. It's the taking contentious topics head on and having the conversations that make the rest of all the change that people want possible. I want my students more engaged. I want higher test scores. I want better graduation rates. I want a more diverse curriculum. Then we have to have these conversations because that can include your staff, your peers, the other educators. Can you have a disagreement about the topics in your curriculum and move forward? Because it's not just in our classroom. Can we work through with community leaders? I did a, a shorter, different, but related version of this with a district here in Maine. And towards the end, somebody said, well, this makes me want to go out and have like a Civic Saturday thing in our community. What do you think? I was like, hey, more power to you, right? Getting outside of the boundaries of that, really building your community. Can you get your parents and school board and you know potential members of your community who might not be happy about these conversations, can you get them to go have the conversations and see what it actually looks like? I mean, that's the Civic Saturday from Eric Lau. It's not everybody agreeing. It's not being on side. It's, I think the sky is blue. Yay, thank you for being here today. Oh, I disagree with you. Yay, thank you for being here today. But it's that basic idea that we can work together and be disagreeable. And that's okay, because it builds our community, builds stronger. Um, the quote comes from somebody else. I, I always attest it to one of my mentors who always says, none of us are as smart as all of us. And my concern is that if we can't keep finding ways to work together, then our communities will suffer. Because it's not five people in five separate rooms trying to come up with their own best idea. It's five people sitting in a room, all sharing their ideas, building off of one another. That's our solution. And bringing it to a community where a majority or all hopefully can buy in and support it. It's not divisiveness. That's not going to help. But we have to take it on. And there are resources. I've talked about uh, Diana Hess, Paul McBoy multiple times. Their book, The Political Classroom, was their follow-up to Controversy in the Classroom. 
um, resource, stuff like that. They talk about doing structured academic controversies. Got a little bit of the pedagogy here. So I'm watching my time. The one I do when I do full workshops was Abraham Lincoln a racist. I give them speeches. I pick the speeches. Kind of seeing both sides of it. They work with the speeches. It's a framework. Both sides have the same amount of documents that support their side. Both sides were given the same amount of time. Both sides were given the same exact structure. Can anybody always find a reason to be upset? Absolutely, right? I'm not gonna say, well, I'll just do a structured academic controversy and nobody will be upset. But I think if you can say, here's the structure in place. Yeah, we talked about this topic, but I always talk about things like, can, can your students point at it, right? So you give them evidence to work with. So you say, Allison, where are you getting that from? Oh, well, it was something I, I heard. No, 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 documents. Let's come back to the documents. And if you pick the documents and provide the documents, know the documents, right? You can listen to students working in small groups. It becomes a primary source analysis piece, which we love in the social studies, right? We're back to a skill. They're listening, they're repeating back. Listening is a skill. Synthesizing information is a skill. It's not about was Abraham Lincoln a racist. It's about finding a topic that gets kids interested. Like, oh, hmm, I didn't know. Let me talk about this. Let me read about this. And they got better at reading a primary source, annotating a primary source, listening, taking notes, synthesizing, et cetera, et cetera. You can pull these up. Procon.org has a lot of resources. Give them these topics and the information. Here's what you're working with. It's not about what you heard at home or what you saw online or what you saw on TV. Build off of this work. I mentioned thinker analytics and an argument map earlier. I love argument maps. Full disclosure, I love argument maps so much and I bugged them enough that they invited me on their invited me to be on their advisory board. So just so you know, if you find out later on, I'm not trying to sell you a bill of anything, full disclosure, but I love like the argument map because it's a way of laying out a topic Right? Should schools reopen? They give you both a pro and a con side. And what they do is they've created this tracking system where it's an aligning of your evidence and what supports what. So you could have students tackle a, a topic like this, any of these topics, and not have to necessarily get into an argument or fight one another. They can just write it out. And they build in online puzzles. Oopsie, this is what I'm looking for. where the kids don't even necessarily have to put all the pieces together or think it through themselves, they can fill in, well, what are the pros of affirmative action? Here's the missing pieces. We should promote diversity. Uh, what's the biggest thing? Colleges should practice affirmative action. Because why, right? So you start to figure out the pieces and where they go. And you can check what's right or wrong. You can see the solution. And students are having to work through and manipulate these pieces and think without taking that sand. But what I like, where I first got hooked on the argument maps, is have a small group of students engage in your discussion and have you know, two-thirds of the class just map it. Can they follow what's being said? Because what got me when I first heard the talk is they say too often we argue past one another. We don't give 
evidence that actually directly responds to it. We're just talking, right? Like I said, we engage in discourse all the time. An example they gave is Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time. He's got the most Super Bowls. No, John Elway and Peyton Manning have more yards. But those, those don't relate. It's, and the example I gave is the argument is what defines the greatest quarterback of all time. You have to agree. Is it most Super Bowl wins? Well, then it's Tom Brady. Is it most passing yards? Well, then it's Peyton Manning. So it's not Tom Brady versus Peyton Manning. It's what defines that piece. But when you do the argument maps, what you do is you figure out where you're not connecting in your discussions. So that brings us back to Valerie one more time. Remember the wisdom of the midwife. Breathe, she says, and then push. <laughs> because if we don't push, we will die. If we don't breathe, we will die. Revolutionary love requires us to breathe and push through the fire with a warrior's heart and a saint's eyes so that one day. I stopped at one second too late because one day she talks about the experiences of her son as she finishes the end. But that leaves me with the question for you all. Are you ready to push and to breathe? Not because it's easy. Because like she says, if we don't, we will die, metaphorically in this case. But this is what our students need. This is what our community needs. This is what our, our democratic republic needs and our country needs, this ability to be able to have these conversations. And yes, it does fall on us. Because if not, if not us, who? And if not now, then when? I'm not, I'm not sure where that next time will be. So I did hit my time marker, though I will stick around because we do have at least one question here. We'll have more of an open discussion at this point. Um, that's my email that you can get a hold of me. That's the phone number. Um, even though I'm not working from the office right now, it will send me a voicemail and I will follow up. There is a link to the presentation. I will drop this in the chat. And of course, now it's not going to let me. thought I had that. I put it nice and all spelled out so everybody should be able to type that in. So I'm going to go ahead and end the recording at this time and then we will start to take um, any open questions or anything you need at that point. So thank you everybody for watching.